Schönen guten Abend, liebe Freunde. A very, very warm welcome to all of you today to the session on sustainable and stunning. Goethe Centrum Hyderabad, known for its uh, promotion of German language and culture, does do variety of cultural activities. And even during these lockdown days, we have continued, thankfully, due to the technologies that are available, our German classes are on online, examinations are on, and we're very happy that the technology allows us to reach out to the world and bring the world in to us as well, closer to us as well. So 15 years of Goethe Centrum in the fields of music and fine arts and photography and literature, environmental issues, women's issues, architecture. You will be happy to know that later in this month, we will have Dr. Uh, B.V. Doshi, uh, who will kickstart an architecture talk on art aesthetics and architecture, and so on. And the question is, why is Goethe Centrum doing something on fashion? Well, A, we all love fashion. We all love to dress up. And we all look, look nice, look, uh, look, um, try to look nice. But there is another deeper reason. We are committed to environment. And every act of our living is somewhere or the other connected to environment. And therefore, the questions are, how does fashion connect us to the environment, to the immediate issues of nature, of waste, of toxicity, of welfare of small trade, skilled labor, et cetera. These are the issues that we need to look at as we do talk about something which seems very remote from environmental issues, but is deeply connected. In this context, about a year ago, the Ministry of uh, Culture and Media of the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg in Germany invited Hyderabad to participate in their India Week, which is a biannual event. And in October, November 2019, Hyderabad was very happy to take our very own creative person, Bina Rao, with her um, clothes line, with her, with her tagline, to a very uh, renowned uh, panel discussion, as well as a fashion show, uh, at the India Week, which was also on sustainability. So the session title we have retained from what was at the India Week in 2019, uh, Sustainable and Stunning. We wanted to recreate this experience in Hyderabad. And we were gearing up for a March-April event, which then had to be stalled. And all physical events, of course, have been shelved. And therefore, we thought, we need to somehow still carry on, and we did. And this is how this particular project has come into being. A concept that came about was to create a video on fashion. Um, we couldn't have a ramp walk. Uh, and this concept was then fine-tuned by Bina Rao and Manike Rao, along with a filmmaker, Apurva Marur. And hence, we have a wonderful amalgamation of uh, the story of sustainability, of stunning product lines, and um, something that is online. Uh, and hence, this video has come about. Uh, I thank for the support uh, to the Ministry of uh, Culture in Hamburg, my colleagues, Julia Doutel, Julianne Sayreshi, and of course, my colleagues um, and friends at, at, uh, at Creative B, but also at Goethe Centrum Hyderabad. So I would like to, and call it very ambitiously, the world premiere of sustainable and stunning video. And then we will proceed. It's about a nine minute uh, video. Uh, very pertinent to our subject. So I request Pal, Jyoti Biswada, our program coordinator, and Satinder Pal, who is our web and media uh, resource coordinator, are in the backstage, but really the backbone of this particular and all other projects. I request uh, Pal to please uh, uh, launch the video. 
there will be some time lag there will be uh, uh, synchrony issues because this is online and through various uh, platforms uh, so do bear with us uh, there will be a possibility to see it on youtube later please begin it straight from the beginning please the first the beginning okay this looks like it In October November 2019, Goethe Centrum Hyderabad collaborated with the Ministry of Culture and Media of the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg in Germany. What emerged was a novel event with Bina Rao on social, sustainable, and stunning. A high profile set of panelists, academicians, and practitioners from Germany and Bina Rao discussed ramifications of slow fashion. This was followed by a fashion show with German models donning creed to be clothesline, showcasing printing and dyeing techniques in the magnificent Gothic structure, the museum, Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe in the heart of Hamburg. This video and the ensuing panel is a continuation of this dialogue on sustainable fashion. Sustainable and eco fashion brand Creative B is deeply rooted in fair and sustainable practices over two decades. Sustainable fashion collection has been styled with the fabrics produced uh, with five distinctly different Indian traditional textile techniques. And these techniques have survived over centuries. Not only the technique, but these have been the source of uh, livelihood for artisan communities. Uh, designed by us at Creative B and hand woven, hand dyed, hand block printed at Creative B Dye Farm. Uh, there has been zero use of electricity. Uh, every stage of production has been done by hand, so generating a huge opportunity for livelihood. So this collection is truly, truly sustainable. I hope you enjoy it. globally because it is talking about an enduring style that is unlike fast fashion which is like the trend for this season and then without the next. It is talking about 
an enduring style that is, if you like, timeless. And it also supports the people who are making hand-woven textiles, the people who are taking the time to carefully structure and tailor the garments for what we call a slow fashion. It is talking about eco-friendly because you don't just wear and throw away. Slow fashion should be one that we all subscribe to. Fashion is not just a trend. It is a wake-up call for the designers and the manufacturers of fast fashion, where the fabric, the dyes, the the entire pattern wastage that goes in the landfill. Um, sustainable fashion is circularity, responsible consumption, uh, use of natural and biodegradable fabrics and all raw material. Fair wages across the production chain of the garment making and um, zero carbon footprint. So, let us join the movement. of sustainable fashion um, as a solo show it was shown first at Hamburg um, at MKG Museum as part of India Week and also in continuation to the exhibition that was going on uh, for slow uh, design. I am really thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my views on sustainable fashion and also have a fruitful discussion with uh, other two eminent German speakers uh, which happened just before this show. Thank you.
there we are stunning and sustainable i would like to invite now abir gupta our moderator for the evening who will talk to our distinguished panel from all over the place so while we all know Bina is in Hyderabad, we have Uttarakhand, we have um, uh, Malaysia, we have New Mexico and US being represented. And Abir himself is in the northern part of the country in Leh and Ladakh. So I would like to invite Abir, who is currently the director of the Krishnakati Foundation in Hyderabad and the Aachi Association India in New Delhi and Leh. He has directed several documentary films and curated art education and community media projects. His research is based in the Western Himalayas, in Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir around oral histories, material cultures and visual archives. His publications include the visual and material culture of Islam in Ladakh, which came out in 2014, discovering the self and others in Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh by Sage in 2014 and a sense of place Islam in the Western Himalayas, which came out by Marg in 2018. He is an anthropologist, a visual anthropologist from Goldsmith College, University of London. Over to you, Abir, to take us through the evening. Thank you so much, all of you in the audience. Thank you for the distinguished panelists. And of course, Abir, for um, this wonderful evening that we look forward to. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Amita. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, all of you who have taken the trouble to take this time out and, and, and spend these one and a half hours with us. I hope this is a, a, an extremely fruitful experience for all of you. Um, as uh, Amita already mentioned and has been um, reiterated in the film that we just viewed, um, Industries related to global fashion have expanded many folds over the last decades, consuming more and more natural resources and creating more and more waste through the non-biodegradable raw materials that they continue to use and the problematic policies around labor that they continue to work with. But consumers like us are fast becoming aware of such uh, social and environmental practices of the fashion industry can these fashion brands reimagine their production process, um, retaining uh, in some ways their scale of production? But what are the difficulties involved with it? So we have a lot of questions that we hope uh, to discuss and uh, hope to hope uh, you know to kind of shed some light on. Um, for instance, designers and NGOs who are working with artisanal communities. How important are the aspects of sustainable fashion to them? How do they use them in their work? Sustainable fashion hopes to also engage with environmental practices, as we just heard in the film. However, the real question is whether fashion industries are also able to sustain livelihood and save working environments. Then, of course, there is the idea of raw materials and how they are related to the idea of sustainable fashion. What are, therefore, the challenges and opportunities of implementing these circular businesses, which again, Bina mentioned in the film and will perhaps elaborate in the talk that she's about to present to us. So what are the challenges and opportunities of circular business models, adopting sustainable production options, and what are the long-term solutions? These are some of the concerns that um, is very, very central to the work that our speakers are involved in. These are questions that we hope to uncover through the presentations of our eminent panelists that we have this evening. Our first speaker, who you have already met very briefly in the film, is Bina Rao from Hyderabad, India. She is the co-founder and the creative head of a social enterprise and sustainable fashion and textile brand called Creative B in Hyderabad. Creative B also works with underprivileged weavers and artisan communities across the country towards training them in sustainable livelihoods. Bina, is a Bina Rao is a pioneer fashion label in sustainable fashion and textiles. She's a member of the advisory committee of the handloom, uh, uh, committees of handloom boards of the government of India. She was on the governing council of the NID, a senior consultant to the United Nations Eastern Africa program. She was also the team leader of UNDP's Disha pilot for 2000 women weavers of Telangana 
And of course, she's the trustee of the Creative Bee Foundation. So without much ado, I would really like to request Bina to please. Um, so first, Bina, please unmute yourself. That's the most important thing. And then uh, we are really keen to listen to you. Your presentation, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Abir, for uh, the introduction and uh, uh, coming on the board as a moderator. Um, challenges, of course, are many. But uh, uh, the, I would like you all to you know, have a glimpse of the history, uh, the industrial revolution. Um, I mean, what we lost, what we had, you know, all that is very crucial at this point of time when, you know, we are talking about uh, reviving the knowledge and uh, practicing sustainable fashion. So uh, the industrial revolution started, as you all know, in India from end of 18th century, but it really took off uh, between 1902 to 1960. And... Um, uh, country was thriving, you know, the, the spinning mills came up, the cotton uh, uh, weaving uh, factories, uh, the century cottons, the phoenix mill, the kesoram cotton, there are n number of large industries which have contributed in the growth of uh, Indian uh, economy and industrial growth. And these names are still around. So country while becoming industrial, the looms and the cottage industry did not immediately get affected, you know, first decade. We, we didn't feel the pinch of it. But today, 50, 60 years down the line, um, we have almost lost the knowledge of uh, natural dyes, you know, and our handloom sector is almost dwindling. It's very painful to accept the fact, but we are struggling to survive, particularly in this uh, pandemic times. Um, we at Creative, we have always practiced uh, sustainable uh, practices such as uh, doing everything by hand, all the processes of weaving, yarn, winding, boiling, extraction of the color. And, uh, you know, we had decided to start it as a social business, uh, deeply rooted into uh, ethical practices, also collectivizing the artisan and imparting training. Um, so this has been part of Creative B from the beginning. It's over two and a half decades, as you have just heard. Um, but... Uh, it's not late for the big brands, you know. I would say the big brands, the international brands, the big companies, we are just 40, 50 years away from what we had. The India had the knowledge and, uh, you know, coming back to the main topic um, of um, sustainable fashion. Uh, sustainable fashion, ethnic fashion, fair fashion, and uh, upcycle, earth-minded, minimalism, slow fashion, are these mere trends? When I go to the design school, you know, to give a guest lecture, uh, a lot of uh, students ask me, "Is are these trends which will come and go? No, no, no. They are not just passing trends. Believe me, they are going to rule the world um, of fashion in future. And uh, so, I mean, not now, let us look at the reality. My husband, uh, who's an expert in dyes and uh, he made Creative Bee Farm, dye farm. He, in his words, the reality comes out. He says, in the present day scenario, it is not possible to replace chemical dyes, you know, and mill made natural fabrics completely. Because so much of research development is going on. There is a huge investment that's happening, keep happening on in this sector. And even a fraction of that investment and effort goes into uh, you know, the, the resources to uh, resources of sustainable fashion. Uh, it can earn a reasonable uh, market share. And uh, also there is a vacuum in the supply chain of uh, sustainable products. Uh, the world is waking up to it. So uh, it, at least it would meet the requirement of bed linen, uh, children clothing and fashion. Now, these are his words. Um, I'm very optimistic and I keep on uh, advocating for everything that is sustainable and I can see the growth, you know, I can see the young designers following the footsteps. Coming back to Abhi's question, um, is there enough production of sustainable raw material to feed the demand of sustainable fashion? Now, here we are, you know, this is what is the main difficulty. We are just waking up to everything that is sustainable, food, fashion, home, everything we suddenly want sustainable. So if an organization 
after a conscious uh, decision uh, decide that they want to uh, you know really branch out into sustainable production any large company uh, the lead time would be three to four years because you know the resources that we have are unorganized um, they need to earmark large chunk of land where they can start cultivating uh, the organized uh, raw material farming if it comes to the dyes it comes to the organic uh, yarn the organic cotton it's the same thing or the other option is that they can adopt the villages of farmers and they can have a win-win arrangement, you know, profit sharing, and uh, they can uh, then three, four years down the line, have a standardized supply of uh, raw material and country as large as ours. We have juice industries, we have, we have cotton itself. Cotton itself is a very earlier was absolutely unorganized sector, but huge amount of cotton is being produced. So it is possible. And also viewers villages can be, um, collectivize, they can the channelize into the production, which can directly go to the market without any middleman. You know, the companies can set up their operations, the back and front end operations at the periphery of the, uh, the village or a town. You know, uh, India is known for, the rural India is known for semi and skilled human resource. And today in pandemic situation, uh, we have a lot of reverse migration happening. You all know that people are moving back to the, their roots. And uh, in such times, I think this is the best time if anybody would want to start the sustainable production uh, of woven products, hand printed, dyed, or for that reason, even garment making. You know, there is a huge resource available. And why I'm saying that the operations have to be on the periphery of the village, there is a risk. The company has to comply for all the policies of, uh, you know, the, the recycling, upcycling, community networking, and looking after the pollution, checking on the pollution, um, all these things. But uh, as you see in my practices, there is a, there is a less of uh, power consumption and there is less of uh, mechanism. And you could, everything that is done by hand, you know, will be polluting the environment less. I mean, it's an it's obvious fact. So um, there is no better time than this. If anyone decide to scale up their operations, if they are small scale, they want to diversify. Also, you have expert, experts who have not lost the thread of knowledge. You know, the thread of knowledge, fortunately, is still alive. We have people who know about natural dyes, people who have been working. You, in the panel itself, you have us, you know, we have few, few of us who have been doing small and medium scale operations we we produce for the world you know the what world wants we make for them so this is just one small example that the knowledge is there and people like us who are also ready to collaborate people who are wanting to share the knowledge for the mm, good of the world also um, the new generation that started coming in with uh, you know similar sensitivity of uh, sustainable uh, um, practices and uh, uh, I think it's a time now that uh, people really start looking at uh, using the indigenous knowledge and putting that into the scale up operations. So uh, also there are uh, you know areas where uh, big fashion brands want to collaborate, they want to source from India but we don't have a uh, structured supply chain and uh, whoever in the, the field of uh, um, sustainable production of say fabric, handloom, natural dye, block print, shibori. Our scale is not enough for any big, uh, big brand who wants to come source from India, not source from China anymore, but source from India. And uh, so do we have that time to gear up, you know? There are many questions related to uh, the, the availability of raw material and training of the uh, the weavers and the printers to the, the quality that world wants. Creative B uh, took two, two, over two decades, you know, to train a few hundred artisan, not few thousand. And so training uh, the skill labor to maintain the quality is a challenge. But um, when there was an invention of loom, you know, in 18th century, when loom was invented, when spinning wheel was invented, so much of R&D had gone into, so many years of efforts have gone into it. Compared to that, reviving our own knowledge is a less effort and we can still do it 
now abir wanted me to uh, throw some light on you know designers and ngos working in this uh, artisanal products uh, whether they are uh, they think sustainable fashion is important or not i think they do uh, there is a popular notion that sustainable fashion is what is made with uh, slow processes with environment friendly um, approach but the question is whether the entire value chain involved in the process of making the fashion product is sustaining with decent livelihood and safe working environment this is what uh, i think one has to worry about what go goes behind my clothes it's a very popular tagline you know uh, international brands and the labels who are trying to uh, market the sustainable fashion uh, you see this tagline saying what goes behind my clothes there is a human face uh, that that is behind the scene so this has become uh, not only uh, the usp of sustainable fashion but uh, one really needs to know what is the value chain and who made the clothes it's not one person two person there is an entire value chain and sometimes as you see the collection that you saw in the film uh, if abir gives me one more minute i would like uh to you know sure. to uh through the the sharing of my screen and also sharing some of the value chain you know the the complicate value chains those are involved in the entire process of the collection that you just saw uh do i have time abit yeah about 3 to 4 minutes so let's sure. let's quickly have a look yes, yes. um yes um um yes uh so this is uh, most of uh, most of those who are involved in handloom are aware that right from the yarn spinning to uh, you know for the warp and winding for the weft the n number of artisans involved and uh, if people like us who are using uh wild silk or hand spun cotton yarn there is a variety of uh, hand spun uh, wild silk you can see here in the spindle uh you are providing livelihood to the not only to the weaver before weaver there is one more link which is spinner and the spinners cooperatives the women weavers cooperative exist in india and they uh, have to survive with the very small wages per day that they earn now if you have to channelize uh, the bulk production of these cooperatives then uh, you will have to uh, nourish this link you know you have to pay their wages fairly you have to you know make them comfortable and the argument is that why can't we use the mill uh, mill spun yarn yes we can use we are using in warp we mostly use mill spun yarn for the strength but uh, the kind of texture that is created by hand spun and the human touch can never be replaced so uh the fashion particularly demands the variety and the textures are created uh, as a designer you know i would like to use the advantage of hand spun yarn and uh, advantage of uh, n number of shades that i could get while doing shibori or block print in uh, dye this is the ikkat loom the previous uh, yarn what you saw is the ikkat warp now i did not put in all the slides but before the fabric comes to the loom in ikkat there are five different links and all these five value links uh, provide employment to the artisan so large number of artisan you know hyderabad and around area uh, under uh, past 3 years 2000 women weavers have been trained by us uh, to market their own produce because they have been exploited they don't earn enough so they put in 8 hours or 10 hours of hard work collectively as a family and if they cannot market directly their product there are in between uh, mediators by the time the product go from village to town the markup is added from town to city to the emporium to the uh, multi chain stores so the product becomes so expensive and the myth is that handloom products are expensive why are they expensive you know so um, moving on to the next slide um the warping in the villages if you walk into one of the villages that we work with in the morning from 9 am to 12 uh, there will be every street will be you know uh, 
stretching their warts. So after dyeing the stretching, you see how many number of people are employed in each uh, value chain of handloom. And if we uh, try to replace this value chain with any mechanism, uh, there is a lot of debate and argument going on these days. Why power loom is not allowed? Ikat can be tied and dyed by hand, the yarn, but then it should go on the power loom. But if it goes on power loom, then the weaver is going to lose the livelihood and uh, power loom and hand loom can, the feel can never be the same. Uh, I think there is somebody from Tata Okai organization is doing a parallel uh, study on that. What is the difference between hand loom and um, power loom? Uh, uh, see, these are the... Uh, Bina, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, Bina, but can we just wind up in a couple of minutes? Because yeah, we sure. are slightly ahead of... Yeah, 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 yeah sure. So uh, I think this is my uh, last but one slide. Um, so here you can see the raw material uh, that goes into it at farm without zero electricity, without uh, you know any intervention of machine, the products are finished. And the block printing that happens, everything is printed by hand. Even the final finish, the rolling, you know, uh, happens uh, by hand. We don't use any uh, electric equipment for rolling and pressing. Um, so, and I don't want to go ahead with the value chain of dyes, you know, because it's very long. But just to give a glimpse of how indigo can is extracted, what is the cultivation, and then fermentation, and then extraction. And this happens particularly with everything. This is hand-painted Kalamkari value chain. Again, there are five to six stages. And when you see the finished product, so beautiful, you really uh, can't understand the, that how many different um, links to this and how many people have been employed to create the final fashion product. And so all value chains have to sustain. Environment has to be sustained. I'm, I'll stop sharing the screen now, Abhid. Um, and uh, I, my last uh, message to everyone is that um, if you think that sustainable, sustainable fashion uh, is to be promoted, then please help the community of artisan that a designer, as a designer you work with. Just not buy the fabric, just not make your final finished product, but work for six months, one year with the community and see that they are comfortable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bina. Um, without any further uh, delay, we should uh, move on to our second speaker for today, um, Edric Ong from Malaysia. Uh, Edric um, is a multi award winning Malaysian designer of natural dyed fabrics, fashion, and crafts. He is the president of the Society Atelier Sarawak, uh, the Arts and Crafts Society of Sarawak in Eastern Malaysia. He is also the president of the ASEAN Handicraft Promotion and Development Association, an organization that administers the UNESCO AHPADA Craft Seal of Excellence since 2000. Currently, he is uh, advisor of the World Craft Council Asia Pacific and an honorary member of the World Craft Council. He's an architect by training and he has designed several landmarks such as the Sarawak Cultural Village and the Kuching International Airport in Sarawak in Eastern Malaysia. His interest in heritage of his country has inspired him to write several books. He's also been the recipient of several international awards. There are too many, just to name a few, the Mercedes-Benz Stylo Asian Fashion Award in 2016, the Global Fashion Influencer Malaysian Designer of the Year in 2009, the ASEAN Silk Textile Awards in 2009, and so on. He is on the panel of experts for UNESCO and a jury member of the UNESCO Award for Excellence for Handicrafts of the World Craft Councils. Um, I would request Edric to please begin your, your presentation. Thank you very much, Abhir. Good evening, everyone. And it's really nice to be part of the panelists on this very uh, auspicious occasion on the theme that we're talking about sustainability and stunning. Well, Bina and I go back a long way since 1999 we are both initiators of the World Eco Fiber and Textile Weft Network. So our initial um, objectives, if you like, was to promote natural dyes and natural fibers. And at that time, there was not even a mention or whisper about what is sustainable fashion or eco fashion. And it is something that developed 
later and the whole arena of eco fashion then came into play. But we have conscientiously every two years hosted the WEF Forum, the World Eco Fiber and Textile Forum hosted here in Malaysia since 1999. So I'd like to introduce first to you what I am involved in doing and sharing my screen with you. So Slow Fashion by Edric Ong. Currently what I'm doing is that I'm actually, if you like, upcycling and uplifting garments or material or fibers. This one here is actually a kimono haori with shibori, which is made in Japan. But I've taken this and then I have turned it and given it, if you like, a resurrection in my own style hand stamping indigo leaves, hand painting elements into it to give it a new life. So it becomes something which is stunning in its own way and giving it a new identity. Natural dyes, natural fibers and fashion. That's what I am all into. My design philosophy follows what William Morris has been talking about. My work is the embodiment of my dreams. And I like the word dreams because I've been working for the past 35 years with my community of Iban Ikat weavers doing puak kumbu, ties that bind, and these were known as woven dreams. So everything, if you like, starts with a dream. Handwoven natural fibers and textiles in fashion. My sojourn, my journey into the design of handmade textiles and fashion has seen me combining a touch of the ethnic and oriental with the contemporary, innovating traditional styles with an unusual creative twist. Here, if you like, these are actually handwoven silks from uh, Creative Bee from India. This is hemp but I've combined it with hand-plated and hand-woven rattan from our indigenous people. And then this was a collection that I called Jungle Jingle because the bells were placed at the end of this ornament so that they jingle as you walk, as you walk along the runway. So I've been involved with Iban Ika in fashion all these years, and I believe and subscribe to what following what India has been doing as the uncut cloth wearing the sari, the six meter long sari. Here it is, this is uncut cloth, the wap ikat from the Iban worn as a cape. Here I put in this photograph because this was a fashion show that we did in Hyderabad in the uh, UNESCO uh, uh, symposium that we hosted on natural dyes in Hyderabad. I've forgotten the year, but here it is uh, the Indian models wearing my indigo handwoven silk ikat. Here again, this is an Indian uh, male model from Jaipur. He was uh, a friend of mine and he came to Malaysia to model. And this is a raw silk vest with uh, rattan as the buttons. And this, if you can re recognize, Bina and I have been collaborating on using the in indigenous Iban Ikat motifs, but woodblock printed in natural dyes on silk for fashion. So my latest work has been upcycling hand-painted leather jackets. So these jackets are given a new lease of life whereby I have hand painted using one of my indigenous artists, the motif of the tree of life onto these jackets. And this was showcased in a fashion show in Taipei. I've been also working with communities in Northern Thailand, as I'm also president of the ASEAN Handicraft Association. These are hand knitted hemp, hand knitted hemp, I've given them the textures and the styling and they knitted for me and these were then marketed in America. 
This is again an uplifted uh, leather jacket with uh, native design. And the, the scarves here are what you call uh, echo printed thick leaves. Some more, and I believe always in working with communities in making these bandanas of uh, fashion accessories as well. And the hats, which has been restyled and innovated from the traditional cap into a funky, cool rattan hat known as Top Pitunjang. Some other uh, aspects of the, uh, the hemp. And here again, the, and the latest other, I, I, I love researching and looking and finding uh, new colors from the nature. And I've been using wild figs, which grow uh, well in the tropics. This is what the Japanese would call kakishibu but I have discovered the tropical kaki shibu and uh, use them in, this is the, the kaki shibu, wild figs, ficus fistulosa, fermentation dying. You don't need anything to fix the colors. After you've dipped it in the dye, you leave it out in the sun, like the kaki shibu, the persimmon, and the sun fixes the colors and draws up the tan color, if you like, the khaki color, and make it uh, fixed. So this is one of my creations, a tree of life with the khaki shibu, the ficus fistulosa. Here it is, a tree of life, hand-painted as a, a tapestry, but using, again, the uh, wild fix. This was a fashion show in uh, New Delhi, as part of the World ECAP Textile Forum and exhibition at the Beaconer House with Indian models. And again, as you can see, these are rare, uh, like capes. There are two pieces of large uh, WAP ECAP in silk worn as a cape. This is another collection, totally hand dyed in natural colors by me, and then restyled. This is rattan hats. This is bandanas fashion accessories. This is hand stamped indigo leaves. And so this is the very concept that I subscribe to. Here, there's no wastage when you stamp and cut, and cut and stamp the indigo leaves onto the upcycled kimono top. The second print is actually on this hand spun uh, linen, and then you get the double print and so you really maximize the dye from the leaves that you don't waste it at all. So thank you very much, that's my slide. And now I will come back to uh, Abil, who wants to ask me some questions, I believe, Abil. Well, it's, it's fascinating. Um, we actually have a couple of minutes and uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I think we are all very curious is um, you know this very interesting transition that you had from architecture into fashion and uh, you've of course told us your journey within uh, the fashion industry uh, quite comprehensively but i'm personally very con um, sort of very curious you know that how did this transition happen and how is architecture perhaps had a, a role to play in in the work that you do well in a way it's all talking about structures right you are talking about habitat and creating structures for human beings to live in, to work in, and to feel comfortable in. And so my idiom in, in architecture was always tropical architecture, something which is uh, endearing to the climate. So when I went into fashion, fashion was actually, if you like, uh, a by the way, because I've been working <laughs> with uh, Ikat weavers, the Iban Ikat weavers, and reviving the Ikat weaving and getting them to go back to doing Ikat weaving with natural dyes, which they have in a way lost. And then I introduced a new fiber to them because we want to upscale the value from cotton to silk Ikat that it can be worn and appreciated and have better value as silk scarves, dupatas, and for fashion. So from that then, one of my uh, mission statement when we were doing the revival of Iban Ikat weaving was that 
I said I wanted to get this Pua Kumbu weaving on the pages of Vogue magazine. <laughs> so, praise God, after two years of reintroducing the fiber, they've never woven in silk, but after two years, they were able to then transfer from weaving in cotton on the backstrap floor loom to weaving it in silk. And two years later, indeed, we were able to have Vogue magazine come to the Sarau Cultural Village and we had a fashion spread with our innovative Iban Puak Kumbu in silk. And that has been my journey. The, mm -hmm. the, the transition from architecture to fashion, in a way, is uh, <laughs> coincidental. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I'm sure uh, there are already uh, a number of questions that are sort of adding up in the chat box and we will um, return uh, to some of those questions at the end of the next two presentations. But uh, so please, please stay with us. Please don't go away. Um, uh, we uh, will move on to our next speaker uh, uh, for this evening. Um, Judy Freighter in, in the design and the craft community in India, she's a name that almost everyone is familiar with. She's lived in Kutch and worked with the artisans there for over 30 years. During this time, she co-founded and operated the Kalaraksha Trust and established the Kalaraksha Textile Museum. She was founder director of the Somaya Kalavidya, an institute of education for artisans. In 2003, um, Judy was awarded the Ashoka Fellowship for Social Entrepreneurship to develop the first program for design education for artisans in the Kalaraksha Vidyalaya. And here I cannot stop myself but uh, say <laughs> this, that when I was a student in NID and I visited this place, this, 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 this one institution was almost um, a, a most important catalyst to change the way that uh, we conceived design and craft. Uh, coming back in 2009, Freighter was awarded the Sri Misha Black Medal for Design Education and in the following year was presented with the Craft Council of India Kamla Award. In 2014, she joined the KJ Somaya Gujarat Trust to form the Somaya Kala Vidya. Uh, Judy is an author of Threads of Identity, a book that all of us have gone through in, in great detail. And of course, she's written various chapters in, 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 in a range of books on craft. She's currently developing a new venture in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, so Judy, without much ado, can we please listen to your presentation? Sure. Thank you, Abir. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a slightly different slant on sustainable fashion. And I, I'll just begin my presentation and let's hope I can get the technology here. Uh, all right. Now, how do I share? <laughs> how do I share the screen? Hold it. It's the green, okay. it's the green arrow, Judy, in the middle. Uh, yeah, I on got the bottom it. Panel. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. All right, technology is not my, uh, my forte. Okay, so I am going to talk about the role of education for artisans in sustainability today. We all know the problem, we've, all, we've heard it. It's too much, too much what? Too much waste. Every day, tons of trash go into landfills. And among that, a lot of it is textiles, a lot of it is clothing. We have some clear solutions. We've heard some today. Uh, use less, use local, uh, recycle. But the main problem is to throw away less. So our question here is, how can fashion become more sustainable? And I'm going to give you my radical answer. It can't. Because fashion, the very concept of fashion is not sustainable. It has built in obsolescence and it ultimately wants us to consume more. No doubt, if we use handcraft, uh, it's environmentally sustainable. Absolutely. Handcraft uses natural materials, uh, has minimum to no waste and minimum to no use of fossil fuel energy. But if we look deeper at the issue of fashion, we have to come up, we have to look broader. Um, we have to think about using less and using better. 
And so here I'm presenting to you my version of the face of sustainable fashion. This is Ibrahim Bai Jat. He's a traditional Maldhari a, a cattle herder. And people, the original consumers of craft, probably had one or two pieces of each textile. But those textiles expressed their identity. And so there was no need for fashion as we know it today. And yet, I think, I hope nobody would contest that what they had could be understood today as luxury items. The original craft was made to last. Mm. If it were out, it would be lovingly hand stitched into a quilt, never thrown into a landfill. I don't even think they had landfills back then. Um, but why were these textiles so valued because they were well made, but also because they were made by people who the consumer knew and trusted. So now we're going to get to another aspect of uh, sustainability, and that is cultural sustainability, and that's where I come in. The craft, traditional craft, is much more than technique. It's much more than beautiful surface design. It's cultural heritage. It belongs to the people who made and used it, and it expresses identity, it expresses uh, history, relationships, it has meaning in short. And so if we want traditional craft, tradition-based craft to continue, the artisans need to have respect as well as income. Because if we treat artisans as workers, if we use them as workers, sooner or later, they are going to move on to any livelihood that is going to provide them more income. So it's about respect as well as income. That's where I took off. In 2005, I started a design education program for artisans. And the idea was to teach artisans to innovate within their tradition. It's not that they didn't already innovate, they did. Innovation has always been a part of tradition, but to innovate for contemporary markets. And that means connecting them to those markets. And ultimately to be able to regain their agency as conceivers, producers, as well as marketers. I directed the original program, Color Raksha Vidyalaya, for eight years. And then in 2014, I joined forces with the KJ Sumaya Gujarat Trust, and we together started Sumaya Kalavidya. So the program today operates as Sumaya Kalavidya. And uh, I directed the program there for another almost seven years. During that time, I expanded it. It begins with design because that is the base. The, the artisan needs to be able to, to design appropriate products, pro products appropriate to the contemporary market. Then I added a graduate, a postgraduate program in business and management for artisans because everyone needs a little bit of business as well. And then expanded to artisan to artisan outreach programs. And we did work with um, with Reshmi and uh, Avani, and you're going to hear from, from Reshmi as soon as I'm finished, um, and international co-design projects. So all of these are intended to enable the artisan to still retain their agency as the creator of their cultural heritage. Okay, um, the program was amazingly successful. Um, artisans proved their creativity, their ability to innovate with joy and, and vigor. And they also gained a lot of confidence as well as learning design and business. And today, they, the graduates are innovating for the contemporary market and they're earning good incomes. Over the 15 years, um, we've seen, I think, one of the, the successes of the program is to see that Artisans can make unique interpretations of their traditions. Again, tradition was never static, it always evolved, but we're ramping up the pace and the direction. And I think it's significant that in 15 years, we've 
had virtually no duplication. Each artisan can interpret his or her tradition in a unique way if given the encouragement. And I think we've also had an impact on the uh, artisan community and the greater artisan community. And most significantly, young people are returning to the craft. Why? Because they see a future. They see that craft can be contemporary and that it brings recognition as well as income. So we see younger people coming to the design program now and eager to continue in their craft traditions, not as a fallback, not as a last resort, but as an excellent choice. And that is cultural sustainability. So the next frontier is us, us, we, the consumers. Why? Because when artisans can reach this level, they can, they can create products uh, appropriate to the contemporary market. They need a market that recognizes that and is willing to value it and pay for it because craft should not, is not, and should not be cheap. Um, I think we have to recognize that craft is valuable and is expensive, but we don't need closets full. Right? I'm going back to that original uh, point of buying better and buying less. So I think um, going back to Ibrahim Bay, I'm going to add in Mohamed Siddiq, who made his Adruk. And I think if we begin to think about um, who, who made our clothes, as I think Bina also talked about, uh, we can think about an equitable and sustainable version of fashion in which we value the artisan as well as the creation. And I think that key to, to that valuation is the human connection, knowing who made your, your clothes as well as how they made them. So ultimately, the point is value. The issue is value. Um, and I, I would like to, to invite each of you who are viewing this to think about what is in your closet that will never ever go into a landfill and why not? If we begin to think like that, we begin to think about happily buying better and buying less, right? And the, the, the value of craft is the personal connection. And uh, I have a picture here of Ishmael Bai and one of his uh, creations. And when I saw this piece, I could see right away that it was different from the production that goes on. He's, he's, he does rather large production. And I said to him, Ishmael Bai, how do we get this quality? And he smiled and he said, you have to make it with love. So I think if we get back to the personal connection of the, the maker and the user, that craft can be made and used with love. And that is really the essence and the value of traditional craft. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I think that was a really comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, we, I'd request you to please stay on with us because let us uh, listen to Rashmi first and then we will be able to take a, a couple of questions uh, from our audience. Um, so I'll move on to uh, introducing our final speaker for today. She's uh, Rashmi Bharti from Uttarakhand. She's currently based in Uttarakhand in India. She has been working in the field of uh, rural development for the past 28 years in India, uh, in the states of Uttarakhand and Orissa. She uh, co-founded Avani, a voluntary organization in the central Himalayas uh, in India about 20 years ago. She has worked in the field of education, energy, community health, natural resource management, strategic planning, fundraising, and creation of sustainable li livelihoods in remote rural areas. She is the recipient of the Janki Devi Bajaj Award for Rural Entrepreneurship and Women's Empowerment. She, together with her husband, have also received the TN Kushu Award for Conservation and Livelihoods. This award was presented by His Holiness the Dalai Lama 
she also um, received the Nari Shakti Award for Avni's work with Women's Empowerment, uh, an award that was uh, given to her by the Honorable President, uh, Mr. Ramnath Govind in March 2018. So Women's Empowerment and Conservation are an integral part of her work and her work brings together the concept of creativity and sustainability that integrates people, natural resources in one contiguous whole. Um, with uh, no further delay, I'd request um, Rashmi to please make her presentation. I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience waiting very eagerly to ask a lot of questions to each one of you. But first, let's listen to her very, very carefully. Rashmi? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Abir. And thank you for inviting me here. So, um, well, I'm Rashmi and I'm the co-founder of Agni, as uh, Abir just mentioned. I've been living and working in a small village in Uttarakhand for the last 20 years. And the, the focus of our work has been the creation of livelihoods in very remote villages through revival of traditional craft, dissemination of appropriate technology, and farm-based activities. Now, looking at all this, the, the story began really with us where in 1996, my husband and I, we took a decision to move from Delhi to a small village in Uttarakhand. And the change really began with us. We wanted to change our lifestyle and, uh, and wanted to live in the mountains. Now, how we, how we could contribute was the question. So that's how Avani was set up in 1999. I'll just, uh, just share the screen with you so you can see some pictures of our area. Just one second. So I'm located in a small village uh, close to the border of Tibet and Nepal. It's about seven hours away from the nearest train station. As you can see, it is characterized by natural beauty and extreme isolation. So Avni works today in about 108 villages in two districts, reaching about with uh, about 25,000 people. We work a lot with appropriate technology and with sustainable livelihoods. For this presentation, I'll focus on our work with textiles and natural dyes. In 2005, we established a cooperative of artisans and farmers. It's entirely owned by the people who make the products. It's called Kumau Earthcraft Cooperative, and the brand is Avni. Earthcraft works today with over 2,000 families, 78% of which are women. So the cornerstones of our work have been people, prosperity, and planet. We truly believe that if, if, the, if the rural communities have stakes in any kind of enterprise that's created, the forest resources get conserved, people inhabit very remote areas and continue to look after them, and it, it strengthens the economic prosperity of the region. So with these three principles, we have set up this uh, rural enterprise. We are looking at sustainability, empowerment, and the preservation of lifestyle of artisans. Because people live in very remote regions, they should have a choice to continue to live there rather than outmigrate to cities. That's one of the very crucial aspects of our work. It's a community-led cooperative. A lot of socially vulnerable women and school dropout young girls are involved in it. The cycle, the production cycle is circular. We look at the cultivation of natural dyes, the dyeing itself, production of handlooms and garments. We use only clean energy. We do rainwater harvesting as well as wastewater recycling. So it's a low carbon footprint, fair trade, and non-toxic production cycle. The solutions around water and energy. Now, when we decided to set up the enterprise with the community, we, look, we saw that the ecosystem around craft needed to be addressed for sure, which included water, energy, dyes, and detergent. Any textile production tackles all the three issues. So we use clean energy from solar or from biomass. We recycle 100% of the wastewater to grow vegetables, and we live on rainwater. We harvest about 700,000 liters of rainwater every year, and 
ensure that we minimize waste and the carbon imprint of the production cycle. Looking at the pollution caused by synthetically produced dyes, we took a decision at the beginning that we will only work with natural fibers and natural dyes. So this is a small range of the colors that we offer. We have made about 30 shades in natural dyes. Hand looms have been installed in very remote villages. A lot of young people have been trained to become skilled weavers. And these are the stunning textiles produced by them. These are silk textiles in natural dyes using a lot of traditional motifs. Reviving a traditional pattern. It's called the Almoda pattern. It's now made in silk and wool. We also focused on local wools because that was supporting the shepherd. We are looking at supply chains also where, we, where the local wool made by the shepherd and the products made with it were not finding a market. So we tried to make the products contemporary while preserving the traditional skills. So in our work of 20 years, we have revived the dropped spindle spinning as well as the handloom weaving of the region. This is a product in wild silk. It's the recipient of the UNESCO Seal of Excellence. Six of our products have received that. Again, products in wild silks of Eri, Muga, and Oktasa. And these are the products made with the local wool, and they are also tailored in our region. So we've tried to set up the entire production cycle in the village. Everything is done by hand, generating a lot of wages every year. Garments in pure silk, a woolen muffler. And we also saw that detergent is as polluting as the dyes, the amount of detergent we use. And our area was lucky to have many soap nut trees. And we discovered that all the soap nut was being exported to Europe and America. And the local communities were actually using synthetically produced detergents. So we decided to also parallelly work with that. In this whole process, we've planted more than a thousand trees of soap nut alone to support the, uh, the ecosystem and we also market it now. At the same time, talking to communities about reintroduction of uh, natural soaps in their, in their consumption pattern. As we worked with natural dyes, we saw that it had a direct impact on forest and wasteland. As we started purchasing dye materials, which were mostly waste materials, people started protecting and planting trees. It was an economic decision where when you connect color to the earth, we are directly greening the earth. As you see, these are local plants. Uh, there is marigold, myrobolan, pomegranate, and the indigo cakes made by us. Uh, we've been cultivating indigo for the past eight years now. This is Eupatorium. It's number three invasive species of Asia. There are forests of it all across the Himalayas and in Southeast Asia. So we produce colors from it for the last 20 years. All these colors are made with Eupatorium either directly or in over dyes with indigo. We've removed more than 40,000 kg from the forest floor till today. Looking at the demand for indigo and the outmigration of our region, we tried to connect the two. As a result of the outmigration, the wasteland had increased substantially. There were no people to cultivate the land. And the ones that were in the village, they had decreased the food production because the fields were very far away, there was no supervision, and the pest attacks were very frequent. So we found that indigo became a crop of regeneration and reclamation, actually. We now grow three varieties of altitude-specific indigo with farmers in Kumau region, and uh, they've really adapted well to it. The fields that were abandoned earlier have been covered with indigo now. We've reclaimed about 125 acres of land with this. And the entire process is pretty labor intensive. Our structure is decentralized and it provides income at every stage of processing. Farmers find it a good economic decision. Indigo is also a leguminous crop, so it regenerates the land. 
and in crop rotation really benefits the other crops that are grown with it. These are the indigo cakes. We are calling it the Avni Himalayan Blue. It's a natural indigo produced by us every year for the last eight years. We also produce many dye extracts and powders. As I said, as we start buying waste materials, the people start planting trees. On the left are raw dye powders, which we now make available to users in India and abroad. The, on the right are concentrated extracts, which are ready to use. We also make pigments. And we have made finished products with, color, with natural colorings. These are watercolors and a painting done with our watercolors. 100% pure beeswax crayons with natural dyes. We use Himalayan turmeric and natural indigo and so many others. These are wood stains, again created by natural dyes. So the purpose of all these applications really is if we look at our entire production cycle, the demand for colorants worldwide is about 11 million metric tons annually. We are looking at cosmetics, textiles, art supplies, paints, food, you name it. So our contention is that if we are able to have a, even a very small slice of this market, we are looking at a very large amount of land being reclaimed. We are looking at farmers who, who will be able to earn a sustainable livelihood. And we are creating a very eco-friendly cycle of production. This is linen dyed with our natural indigo in resist printing. So what, what we really feel in this, whole, uh, in this whole fashion and sustainability uh, story is that I feel fashion and sustainability are contradictory by themselves. Because fashion means change. And sustainability means long lasting. It has to last long, as Judy has been saying, and the speakers before me as well. And I believe so too. So I think slow clothing is, is good. And right from the beginning, our whole enterprise could not work with fashion because we, it's a very different lifestyle in the mountains. Things are slow. We, we don't want to create a, a sweatshop. We want people to be able to live in their beautiful homestead in the, at the pace of life that they are used to while earning a supplementary income. We are looking at um, uh, impacting the out-migration too, eventually. Now with the context of COVID, more and more the story of local is becoming very relevant. Our entire team, for example, is from villages where we work. They have been empowered and trained to handle every single aspect of the enterprise. And with this reverse migration, there'll be more opportunities for scaling up and also for offering an alternative. Now, the conversion by industry is not going to happen in one go. It will happen in stages. So if we look at an incremental conversion and a reduction in our consumption, then I think it could match. Today, on one hand, we are talking of... Um, <clears throat> I mean, we are looking at certification of dyes that last for 10 years or 20 years, the fastness properties and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we have companies bringing out 54 collections a year, which means we are going to throw those clothes in two to three months maximum. So if we match the two, if the color fastness is good enough for six months, that, that's fine, even though, even though natural dyes really last for a long time. But I'm just saying the perception is not correct. We are not able to match the two. So two, two things I, I like to say. One, uh, also in continuation to what Judy said earlier, there is a saying called, I'm too poor to buy cheap things. If I buy something which is cheap, I buy it again and again, spending much more money. But if I buy something which is of good quality and more expensive, it lasts me a longer time. And the other uh, the other thing which is a driver for us is to believe in our capacity as change makers, our capacity to bring about change, and to work to leave the earth a little more beautiful than we found it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Um, I'm going to actually just um, sort of 
uh, sort of egg you on to kind of speak a little bit more because there are a couple of questions from the audiences. You spoke of out migration, you spoke of education, you spoke of capacity building, um, but there are a couple of questions which I'm going to fuse and yeah, just uh, sure. present to you yes, again sir. so that if there are any mm. other thoughts you, you'd like to share. So uh, there are definitely challenges in, in uh, scalability. I mean, you spoke about it, you know, in the context of, of COVID as well. But uh, if there's anything else that you'd like to um, refer to as examples, because there was a question on how or, or, or in what way scalability works within the handloom industry. And a connected question to that was about how, I mean, uh, the, the person who's asked the question has, has used the word protect um, uh, traditional weaving, but well, I mean, you know, it, it, it can be looked upon as conserving or developing into new entrepreneurial models, um, again, to kind of stop this kind of migration that is happening into cities from these areas. So if you'd just like to reflect upon uh, this a little bit more, because some of the members of our audience have requested that. If there's any other example that you, for instance, like to cite, because you've already told us what is going on conceptually, yeah. Yeah. See, what we what we are also finding in the last twenty years of our work is that the perception of young people has definitely changed. But who is it that is sticking around with the business? See, we cannot we cannot work with the entire spectrum of society. What we have found is that women and young girls that we have been working with for the last twenty years have stayed with the profession. But I must admit that we have been failures with the young boys. We wanted to work with young boys and men who are migrating out of the city, out of the village. So we, we started out with that, but then we realized that our work has impacted a completely different section of society. So what did it lead to? It led to social change. And, and for me, that is good enough. You know, a good enough because change is very slow. We cannot change en masse. But what we are trying to do now is, let's say we get students from NID, from institutions who have studied weaving. We bring them to the village, and especially if it is boys, we say, you will please sit on the loom and become an example for the people to say this has value. You know, right now, weaving does not have the same, uh, uh, how to say, zing as IT, for example. People, young people don't want to follow that. So we are finding that a challenge. But there are still enough people who want to work with it. So I'm looking at the positive, you know, that's, that's one thing. The other thing I missed in my presentation is that we are now looking at replication of this model also, no? I didn't talk about it. We are saying that if it is possible to live in a sustainable way with a certain size of business or enterprise, then it can be done anywhere. If it can be done in the mountains in such a remote area where nobody was setting up a business, then with the contextual reality, we, we are offering ourselves as a training institution, open and willing to teach people how to set it up, for example, and also how to change the way of looking. See, our eye has now been trained to homogeneity, right? We are, we are, we are used to looking at machine-made goods. So the mm -hmm. training has to begin very, very differently. So we are looking at that. And... Um, also looking at design as a tool for problem solving in any context, not just design as a flight of fancy, you know, as a creative output. Mm -hmm. So all that we, we feel that needs to be tackled and this desire for new every time. Mm. We don't want to look at something for a very long time and say, okay, this design can work for the next 50 years. I mean, Nehru jacket is a very good example. For example, we don't need new every day, you know, innovation doesn't yeah. mean new. Correct. Yeah. So... So I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah. Of course, uh, I, I'm going to segue uh, into another question that was posed by a young friend of ours, a contemporary uh, who's also a design academic mm. and is constantly um, engaging with very young design students. And I'm going to probably request Judy, if possible, to, to respond to this uh, question. Sure. Uh, if I may, Judy, if you can hear me. Um, a friend of ours asks, um, any tips on how to make uh, young students of design, these are not artisanal students, but with, with perhaps your experience of working with students who, who come from artisanal families, he asks that how can we make young do design students um, uh, sort of um, practice 
uh, this using less and using better, you know, this concept that we are talking about, you know, I mean, because when people are coming into the design schools today, they already have an imagination of, um, you know, the sort of global standards and, the, you know, the aspirations and awards that are involved with uh, international design. Um, because um, while, um, you know, sort of they are kind of uh, part of the perils of the fast fashion industry. Uh, so, you know, and, and ironically, sometimes the biggest consumers of it, you know, so how, how does one, you know, so if you do you have tips for young educators like us, you know, in terms of how to, you know, sort of introduce this idea to young students? Yeah. Again, I think the issue is value. How do you create value? How do you slow down? And I think what I see as a, a more viable alternative to what we understand as fashion today is style. Style is your personal style. Slow down understand who you are, express yourself, and then it doesn't have to be, okay, next season I'm somebody else, right? So, I mean, I, I, that's, that's the solution that I see. Uh, and yeah, and again, I, you know, I, when I do programs for children, um, I often use this example, a very simple example. Okay, suppose you have a budget of a thousand, whether it's dollars or rupees, okay? You can buy 10 at 100 or two at 500 or one at 1,000, what's better? And it gets them to think. A lot of times they start out, oh, 10, 10. And then they say, well, well maybe not, you know? So you, you have to look at it that way, right? And that works for the producer as well as the consumer. Because if the artisan is earning two at 500 rather than 10 at 100, I hope I have my mouth right, um, it's better for everybody because less is going in the landfill ultimately, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, Nandan, if you're listening, I hope that answers your question, but also, um, you know, of course, you're free to reach out. Uh, thank you. So Nandan says that it's a wonderful insight. Um, so moving on, um, there is one question that was actually specifically posted for Bina. Uh, and uh, one of our members of the audience wanted to know that uh, how does natural dyeing react to hand spun, hand spun yarn vis-a-vis -vis machine spun yarn. Uh, would you like to, Bina, uh, give a little bit of feedback on, on that question, please? Yes, um, is uh, there a difference in which um, dyes, natural dyes, deal, uh, yeah, react to those? Um, yes, um, in number of ways. Um, basically, if you are working with cotton and if it is hand spun, um, the absorption is much better because it's woven by hand, it's not heavily twisted. But when mill-made yarn is heavily twisted or heavily uh, composed, and so the absorption is little less compared to the hand-spun yarn. Also, if you are working with uh, protein fiber, you know, then, then as uh, Rashmi would also know that many dyes work better on protein and, you know, the hand-spun silk uh, would receive dyes much better than machine-made treated uh, yarn because when you are spinning the yarn in the machine or at the factory level, there is a certain amount of chemicals and processing that goes on to the yarn. And um, that would then not let the yarn receive the dyes in the proper density. So there is a difference and it's a uh, quite a difference that you can see if you put two together. After that. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, Bina, I'll come back to you with another question, but there yeah. is one little question that I want to um, address to, um, uh, to Edric. Um, you know, there was a query, Edric, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, um, Edric, there was a question, uh, is that how, uh, and this is also important uh, that we ask you because you've got such an international profile of working with, uh, you know, these international organizations, that how can some of these big brands be actually convinced, uh, you know, to rethink uh, some of their policies and, and, uh, and perhaps sort of segue into some of these ideas and, and make a better impact through what they are producing? Um, do you have any ideas or suggestions? I mean, how, how do we engage into this sort of area, you know, where we have these I, massive brands yeah, and... Yeah. I, I think uh, just to, uh, again, emphasize or bring on what Judy was saying is talking about style. Mm. Be confident enough to have your own style and not be dictated by what the fashion magazines are telling you should be worn. And I'm surprised if you look at the current Gucci collection, it is something like out of your grandmother's closets or your grandfather's closets. 
take a look uh, on the internet. The latest Gucci collection <laughs> is all like uh, out of uh, a vintage shop. All right. So if you talk about fashion, it's what we talk about. Fashion comes in cycles, right? There's this current trend. Everybody is doing blue, you know, midnight blue or indigo or whatever. But then it comes now that during this period of COVID, people start to realize that maybe it's time to dig into our old closets <laughs> and find what we can res resurrect and wear again. <laughs> so giving it a new life. <laughs> <by being tired. laughs> Taking your grandmother's cardigan <laughs> and putting it in a big few holes, wearing it again. So I think that this whole thing about sustainable and stunning, who are you trying to stun? Right. Who's your target audience? Who's going to tell you that, oh, there's a big hole in your cardigan? I said, no, that's the latest style. You know, I've got big holes in my blue jeans on both sides of my jeans. So that's the thing that when you talk about styling, don't be dictated by what the magazines tell you. I think that young people need to be confident enough, especially if you're a design student, be confident enough to say that this is my style. And if you are really conscious about identity, look back at your cultural identity and see what is there that you can draw in. Because I always challenge the design students where I lecture in Taiwan and in China. I said, none of you who come to my lectures is wearing anything which is handmade. And why are you coming to this lecture? When we're talking about handmade and craft, natural dyes and all that, what are you trying to learn? Can you all come back tomorrow wearing something that is handmade? Right. So uh, that's the whole issue, I think, Abir. But I also want to stress on uh, another point that Rashmi has talked about, which is your three Ps, Rashmi, in your slide presentation. People, prosperity, and planet. Just uh, a few days ago, I was in another uh, Zoom, Zoom meeting. And, and it's talking about planet, people, and purpose. So here, the third P is purpose. Your third P is prosperity. And I think that now we are talking about why we are doing what we are doing is because we need prosperity, which is talking about empowerment of people. Yes. True. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Edric. I, I have a follow-up question for, uh, for Bina, which is what I wanted to come back to. See, Bina, you were talking about industries and brands segueing into sustainable, um, you know, sort of processes. And I'll just read the question out for you. Uh, Bina's suggestion of brands, companies adopting villages. Are, uh, are there examples of this now? I mean, do you have uh, any, any, any such company doing this? And how might it be possible for universities to adopt universities, for instance? You know, like, because like what the question that Nandan asked us and, and the answer that we got from Judy, that how can uh, spaces of education perhaps engage with uh, the same, uh, you know, community clusters uh, more comprehensively? perhaps for practical experience in agriculture, design, et cetera, but also for purchase of products. So that was one of the questions, if you'd like to just yes. share some ideas on yeah. those. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, it's just the beginning. Uh, as you know, my company, Creative V, is into also consulting, and we have been consulting uh, uh, the communities, consulting, taking up consulting projects with UN for other countries like East Africa and, uh, you know, whichever assignment that has been uh, given to us. Uh, when coming to the business houses and brands, a couple of brands have been coming to us and asking us to uh, give them 2000 tons of indigo or, you know, they come to us and say that we, we know that we are producing uh, damaging dyes and how do we go about now? Immediately we need large quantity of dyes for our international branch here and there and we need to launch our, uh, you know, completely uh, sustainable um, safe dye product line. How do we go about it? So this has been our proposal to at least two clients as of now. And I'll be very happy if end of this year I could convince one of them to follow the model that we have been 
thinking would work you know adopting farmers villages share the profit give them annual fixed income assured income apart from on the crop and they would come forward to grow say marigold in couple of farms and then indigo couple of farms and pomegranate and uh, the trees you know myrobalan trees they take time to grow so you could also uh, you know have in cream crops with them my husband you know he is a believer of uh, you know even uh, everything organic so he would uh, want to make his own manure and you know see that uh, the farms are supplement and also uh, we trying to we are trying to tell the client that you know one uh, natural dye um what do you say a uh, value chain would feed another one you may have a juice canning factory you may have a uh, you know dye for the food you may have the dye for the cosmetic because there is a kind of uh, uh, like aneto for example is a plant gives brilliant red color but it's fugitive for textile you know we could only make pale pinks and pale oranges out of it but it's an extremely expensive natural food colorant so mm. it could be the holistic approach to the entire um segment of natural dyes and colors and then you know providing livelihood to the rural uh, indian farmers and artisan also uh, agriculture a university coming forward is a brilliant idea as long as they don't interrupt the sanctity of and the culture of the village you know as long as they respect because i have seen as rashmi was mentioning that i have seen that the designers young designers sometimes uh go to the weavers and say okay you produce this for me uh, you change your loom you change your reed your shaft why would a weaver change his working uh, uh arrangements for just one more a designer who's just visited the village once and say change this so you need long term engagement long term beyond your production what the village require that should be your perception you know anyone working university going to the village or a buyer or an industry uh unless you nourish the plant the fruits don't come yeah. so that's my answer to it i i, I, I think like we are to... the end sorry. of the session i think we uh, abhi would you uh, sorry rashmi yes. would you like to speak? yes yes just please, please. one thing i wanted to say see in regards to the industry what i have seen is or even with consumers to a certain extent they'll say it has to be sustainable eco friendly and cheap right mm-hmm. now <laughs> how, how do you put the three together and it's a big problem because right now what i feel is that this whole story of sustainability has to be driven by people and forests not by industry because what's happening is that even the certification standards i think shivi garg has asked this question that how do we stop people who are not uh, uh, yes. using natural dyes and organic cotton right now the thing is not to stop them the thing is to create a standard today there is no international standard in fact there should be a big lobby saying that we need a separate standard for natural dye because right now it is clubbed with organic dyes and organic dyes are factory produced dyes and natural dyes are plant based dyes so they cannot be put together but today in none of the certifying agencies can certify the dyes so we need a separate standard that's one even the indian government right now i believe they've put together a Uh, uh, a roster of standards they've come out with seven or eight dyes and i think it's in process which is a very good step it could be one way of certifying the dyes um and the they, third thing sorry about no, the cheap it, factor no that really worries me because yeah. i have had discussions with two or three industry people now the the thing is we are always bringing technology we make the raw material fit the technology right which has happened with cotton which means all our short staple cottons got out of the way because the machine can handle only long staple cotton it should be the other way around same with dyes right now all big companies have got their dyeing units already in place which are fed by chemical dyes now when you say please introduce natural dyes they say that no you know our machine is set on this kind of system so natural dyes will not fit in second thing is uh, uh, let's let me give you an example of towels a company says i have got 50 shades of black in towels can your natural dyes give me 50 shades i am asking them do you need 50 shades in towels for black first we are creating a ridiculous demand we are 
making the customer believe they need 100 shades and if the shade doesn't match life is finished you know if one strand doesn't match the color all this has to change you know before we come to working with farmers and so on and so forth so media has a very strong role to play actually in in working in changing the psyche of people then only consumption pattern is going to change because this is only a symptom we have to treat the cause of the problem cause is our thinking and our brainwashing so there i don't know how it all is going to come together but i guess as we interact more and more things things will change they are changing abhi, but yeah yeah abhi do you have yeah. a second uh, for me yeah please 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 uh, literally uh, yes. half a minute <laughs> because the topic has come up i would like to say that in global context you know uh, other countries like france uh, i have visited uh, a uh, 100 hectare farm of madder you know which was very systematically cultivated just uh, son in law and uh, uh, father in law uh, managing that farm and the dyes are uh, going to the industry and as i think uh, most of you are aware of dominic garden the eisen the international uh, natural dye symposium you know we have been trying to formulate a body of certification of dyes because the europe already started uh, using dies at a fiber dyeing stage and also screening level in large quantity and uh, i think india can do that we we cannot uh, rashmi i i would say that anybody who come and ask you to make the dyes cheap or make 100 shades of one uh, dye you know you you will have to uh, think that they are not your client you know or they are not really keen to go yeah, for sure. natural dye because uh, we work with japanese buyers for more than 15 years now and the large japanese company 160 stores uh, retail stores across japan uh, they would understand every difficulty that goes in natural dye the entire value chain they understand and that's how you can we choose our buyers and clients and that's Absolutely. how we been yeah thank you uh, thank you uh, both rashmi and bina for taking up uh, uh, both the questions uh, uh, that that you know we were hoping to return to but there is one last question that i'd like to uh, leave with you all and I'll, i'll i'll let anyone take it really because while it might sound uh, a bit of a truism or a bit of a situation that we've all gone past uh, it is a real concern especially for young people who are entering the world of you know natural processes natural dyes um, you know that can a sustainable brand you know like the ones that we are talking about you know the you know the sort of eco friendly brands actually ever become really big uh is, is there even a need to become big is part of the question perhaps but um, you know the what is you know is it possible to manage the kind of production uh that is required to you know break through you know perhaps just being a small boutique uh bina you've just given us an example from your clients in japan but if anyone else would like to comment on it so just to summarize the last question that we are taking and after this we will close is that um you know what is uh you know you know what is it that you'd like to tell young people you know because this is something that i know is there in a lot of people's minds that you know oh natural dye products handmade products are too niche they are too boutique you know they, it's too elite uh you know how do we kind of break those imaginations and and sort of bring more and more young people and young energy into this into this field uh yes uh, i mean i have an answer but i would appreciate if anybody else yeah, would like to we can we can uh, all like we have a round of yeah, uh, what like, we like my son up. who's the next generation in creative bees uh, business you know and he has plans to scale up natural dyes and uh, now there is a whole trend of uh, uh organic clothing but they don't have the options readily available for natural dye so we have these clients coming uh from organic sector why after making garments t-shirts skirts jackets trousers uh in white organic cotton and over dye it with natural dye and we have mm-hmm. 500 to 1000 numbers uh, garments coming to the farm for dyeing which is absolutely handled manually and my son is of an opinion that some kind of a short mechanism has to come in to reduce the drudgery of washing and rinsing and you know so there is this trend of making white garments putting into the natural dyes because the dye know how is not reaching at a fabric stage or a fiber stage so there is a large scale work going to happen in future and really and uh, young people have to come forward and they have to uh, make the in between way between the the semi mechanized and hand the combination of the two 
so that large production can come up at the same time you don't deprive your artisan and you know livelihood yeah. uh, issues i think that's a very important comment you know that we have to rely on semi mechanization you know yes. we cannot leave everything to the hand yes. um edric would you like to make a couple of final comments be before we move to judy and rashmi and then sort of back up i think that small is beautiful mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that being able to control and to be managing it with your own hands is the beauty of it and you find that even in uh, in uh, mega cities like in in tokyo and japan you find now there is a drift even of young people going back to the farms to live the simple lifestyle mm. and as you say now after the exercise or we don't even know after the exercise what's going to happen post pandemic right covid pandemic there is a shift of values a shift of thinking and even the uh, <clears throat> branding experts and consultants are saying that people are now looking into as you say they don't go out to parties anymore so why should they spend so much on luxury garments right what they are doing more is that they're spending time at home working from the home and so they are wearing comfortable home clothes large comfortable and something which is also like what they would wear when they're doing their the exercise at home gym wear so there's a whole idiom change of mindset which we have to think about and if you can we can really uh introduce to them this whole concept of why we are concerned about the planet why we are concerned about sustainability why natural dyes is better than toxic chemical dyes in what you're wearing more at home when you're lounging around when we you are you're putting clothes onto your babies and your children that these are safe clothing i think this is the message that we have to bring across right it doesn't mean that they have to keep on changing right it's a matter of having as we have all been talking about something which is good something which is comfortable and natural and i believe that the second skin what you wear on your you know your skin is something which to allow your body to breathe and which is a natural fiber thank you judy final yeah. word yes i think uh scale and hand work are diametrically opposed scale is an industrial concept we have industry yeah. if we want things in scale the point of scale is standardization making it cheaper that's not what we're devaluing if we try to make the handmade run after industry we are devaluing it we're going to make it collapse again we have to go back to value and and like edric said small is beautiful another thing thinking about the the whole covid impact what's happening is enforced social disconnection right so i think that should make human connection become more valuable and yes we can't do it we can't maybe go and and hug somebody right now right but our clothes can hug us if we know this is made by irfan bai and um anwar bai together i know that and i wear it and i think of them i mean everybody okay everyone can't know the artisans who made their clothes but we can approach that and i think we have to get rid of this idea of scale scale is again going to fill up those landfills ultimately right because you only have so much closet space yeah. that's what i have to say <laughs> Rashmi, yeah, I think I agree with Edric. Okay. You know, I agree with Edric and Judy because we also feel that small is beautiful. And in the context of COVID, there's much more self-reflection happening. People are mm. really questioning, "Do I need this?" And mm. if we don't need it, that means our buying patterns are going to change. Also, the concept of local futures is gaining ground, right? People want to buy things that are produced nearby. produced within 5 kilometers let's say now this used to happen in all our villages but i guess we are used to exporting an idea and then it coming back to us to re you know to give it importance again 
Our villages mm. are buying, like in the hills, for example, everything is imported from the plains, you know, all food grains, everything. So let us say that the models of local become successful, then it has to remain small, distance, people, everything. So, yeah. So I think small models would be much more workable. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I, 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 uh, Bina, we are way beyond our, our time. You know, I think we'll have to just do another session now. So I, I, I just wanted to thank all of you for, for being so, so generous uh, with your ideas and comments. And uh, also thank the organizers on behalf of the panelists and myself. Thank you, Goethe Zentrum, Amita, Jyoti, Satender. They've been an absolutely amazing team who has sort of put this together the way they sort of um, guided us through how we need to deal with the technicalities and, and, and how we put this together. So thank you so much. I'd like to um, hand it back over to Amita, if you're still there, or yeah. how do we close? Yeah, I thank am, you so I'm much. very much here. I'm not only very much here, but I'm completely keyed into what has happened in the last hour and a half. I believe this was one of the most brilliant set of speakers that have come together on the subject. Different experiences, different perspectives, honest about their work and honest about their their philosophy uh, uh, in in what they promote i think i think i understand more uh, the issues of uh, stunningness which edric brought out uh, and sustainability that all of you have uh, have uh, uh, brought uh, brought uh, brought up in your different uh, experiences um, i think i think i heard several times the words slow, less, upcycle, recycle, um, closet space, uh, resurrect, repurpose. I think these are very, very essential words uh, that we need to reflect on. Um, and I agree, this is a time that, that nature has given to us to really go back to ourselves and see uh, where are we going? Uh, do we do part mechanization? Do we do no mechanization? Have a, a shawl or a piece hug you because nobody else can. I think these are just wonderful concepts to, to reflect on uh, for us to work with, live with, uh, adopt. Um, I, I'm, I'm truly grateful to all the panelists for being here and speaking out honestly uh, on the subject. Abir, you glided us through this conversation so efficiently and so beautifully. You've really stuck to the schedules as they should have been. Bina, I have to thank you for not only coming to us uh, um, to Hamburg, to bring together this particular panel, this was these were your suggestions and 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 uh, connections. Uh, I cannot be more thankful for this uh, this uh, coming together that it has been. I also feel that this subject has a long life yeah. to be covered for by many speakers, all of you, I think, I think we need to continue to deliberate. Uh, it is not only our lives, but it is many lives that are connected to, to our lives. And I um, must thank you all for, for really um, taking up this cause. It's, it's beautiful what you do, uh, continue doing this. I learned a lot today. I thank each one judy thank you for waking up we early hours in the night i was wondering before you logged in should we wake you up because you know it was just so early i would have not made it thank you for doing that uh, edric rashmi Bina, and abir not the least and not the last it was Thank you so much. Thank you all for being with us. Stay tuned. I would like to announce that I uh, do like our Facebook page. Uh, do uh, check out this particular video, which was not very easy to see because we had uh, numerous levels of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know, streaming. Uh, but do, do check out this particular video on the YouTube. Uh, we're very excited that we could bring the Hamburg and the Hyderabad experiences together. Um, do write to us for further programs on our website. Uh, we do have a couple of wonderful things happening uh, in the coming coming months. There is one one particular project on on women who have created uh, empowerment and entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm going to personally write to many of you here. Leave your email ID so that we can put you onto our onto our mailing list. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening. 
and uh, thank thank each, each one of the panelists one more time.